I'm going to read an excerpt from the first telegram in this file, which is actually sent just after the first day of shooting. And he says here, um, the second director went on professional leave. The production manager, Melik Sargassian, who is a pensioner of the KGB, ruined work and is threatening to go on vacation. Uh, the cinematographer, Shah Bazian, has been, turning, has been testing defective film stock from Shostka for six months. Uh, it's hot. Peaches cost two rubles. I'm suffocating from intrigues and stifling rooms with cockroaches. I insist on closing the picture. Send me to Kiev immediately with subsequent voluntary departure from film. Kiev frescoes and the repression of Tarkovsky are enough for me. And that was really, and that's just the beginning. I think that a lot of people who watch The Color of Pomegranates for the first time, and particularly people who don't know very much about Syat Nova, probably think it's a plotless film because it's very hard to follow uh, a plot, even though it is tracing uh, the life of this poet from his childhood to old age. I believe that the Parajanov is a product of Tbilisi culture because when we say about culture, we can always we can say the culture of place exists, culture of town, our city, because every big city has and creates its own culture, and the Tbilisi culture is absolutely unique. Tbilisi had a very rich uh, cosmopolitan culture because historically it was situated on a caravan route, so it was really at the crossroads between the east and the west. And it was also surrounded by three very powerful empires, Russia, Turkey, and Iran. And the actual city of Tbilisi is really interesting because it had a very diverse mix of people, especially during the 19th century, but even, even up through you know, the mid-20th uh, century, I would say. Uh, you had, of course, Georgians, you had Armenians, uh, Persians, Kurds, Russians, um, so on and so forth, all living together in the same space. And the Armenians especially um, played a large role in the city because they were the merchant class. And that's where Parajanov comes from. He was born in open, as we call now, Italian uh, yard. But it's not Italian yard, it was Tbilisi yard, where uh, they got the common yard as a common uh, source of water, common source of uh, kind of facilities. And all people live in the balconies, and everything is so open. And you see some quarrels of neighbors, and you can see laugh of neighbors, mainly, maybe uh, as a guy. And by some rumors, Parajanov uh, father got a kind kind of Brussels, Brussel in, <laughs> not Brussels, but one uh, room which was uh, used for, for people and uh, uh, even uh, he uh, was um, uh, in some relationship, I mean father of Parajanov was in some relationship and uh, was quarreling with his uh, wife, he, was, he lived above, but he uh, got his lover below, uh, all this happened in one yard. <laughs> His father was the owner of a commission shop, and he collected antiques and you know, sold them at a profit. And Parjanov had a constant flow of antiques in and out of his household. And he also developed a very sophisticated knowledge of antiques and even traded in antiques periodically later on in life when he was unable to make films and didn't have a way to support himself. The Tbilisi culture, main feature of Tbilisi culture, it's a theatralized, it, it's theater, it's moving theater. You always are in theater and people are behave themselves like they are in theater, they are on a stage, a lot of spectators.
Initially, Parjanov was educated at a Russian school in Tbilisi, which is interesting because actually Russian became his first language, and he spoke Russian better than he spoke Armenian as an adult. Um, after, he, after primary school, he went to the Tbilisi Conservatory where he studied voice and violin. And you can see this great sensitivity to music in his films, I think, as a result of that. And also, his, I think also his knowledge of music helped him think about film in a different way, as film as a kind of musical structure, among other things. Later on, he went to the VGIK, or the All-Union State Institute of Cinematography. And I think if you want to understand Parajanov's aesthetic as a filmmaker, I think it's important to keep in mind what students were learning there. And you have to remember that um, the faculty at the VGIK included Lev Kuleshov and Sergei Eisenstein. So filmmakers were, the, the students were exposed to a very sophisticated mix of film theory, philosophy, art history, literature, and this all informed their aesthetic, and Parajanov as well. If you want to be honest, his earliest films are not as good as his mature works, the films coming before Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors. And I think there are a few reasons for this. Um, first of all, he didn't really have choice in the film scripts. These were studio assignments, and they were relatively low-budget films, mostly genre films. I think also Parjanov hadn't quite found his, his identity as an artist. He knew that he wanted to do something very expressive in terms of visual style, and he tried all sorts of different interesting techniques in his early films. It was only at, when he did Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors that everything coalesced for him as a filmmaker. <laughs> Then he also managed to assemble a really talented crew. Besides himself, of course, there was the cinematographer Yuri Ilyenko, who um, had only directed a couple of films but had already started to show a great deal of promise. But what was interesting, though, is that there was a lot of conflict on the set, especially between Parjanov and Ilyenko. And in fact, uh, the film almost shut down. Uh, is this moving camera? Of course, it's a Kalatozov style of film. It's, it's, it's, a, it's was like a new wave of camera work and with inventing of uh, introducing the wide angle lens, this wide angle lens producing these movements which was very active and dynamic because when you move with wide angle, you move uh, the uh, more attractive way and uh, it's more um, uh, saturated with emotions and emotionally very interesting. But uh, then happened a quarrel, as I know, uh, between uh, Ilyenko and Parajan, because Parajan created, he's a giant, he's a great, uh, and Ilyenko got his own ambitions. He, you, he wrote and said many times that uh, it was his film, that without cameraman you will not have this film. He was the eyes of Parajan. Of course, he was really eyes of Parajan. So I always told Parajan, I told Parajan, oh, Parajan, it's Ilyenko's merit that you became so great. He was so crazy about it. Oh, no! Kia Frescos, I think, is actually where his full mature tableau style originated. The thing to keep in mind about this film is that it was supposed to be about the 20th anniversary of the liberation of Kiev from the Germans. So it's a contemporary topic. Um, it's, the plot is very simple. It's about a man who's unnamed, a filmmaker, it's, but it's clearly supposed to be Parajanov, a longshoreman and a war widow who works in a museum. And the three of them cross paths and the longshoreman ends up meeting the widow of the museum. If, if you look into the scenario, everything was uh, politically correct, you know. Yeah, the, the, the soldier who won really the war and generals who are now uh, degraded. So, so this is, this is the, the main meaning, uh, the, the, the 
ideological meaning of the film can be said by, by only by this short formula. But all the other things were so strange for Soviet reality, especially if he was speaking about such sacred things as war, World War, uh, World War II. The script was very episodic, and it had all sorts of really interesting, ironic details about contemporary life. But what was striking is that there was very little dialogue in the script. And in fact, the censors even complained about it when, when the film was under review. And Parjanov even notated um, specifically that he wanted pantomime in a number of the scenes. So he's already, started, he's already starting to experiment with pantomime. And you can also see this tableau style that he develops in the, the color of pomegranates in the screen tests for Kiev frescoes because he was able to shoot screen tests, but after they saw them, they were very disturbed by the, their radical stylization. Although, although he was never able to make the film, he carried, a lot of, he carried over a lot of specific visual ideas from Kiev frescoes into the color of pomegranates. For instance, you see a seashell dangling from the ceiling. Um, there's also a scene where the war widow um, is taping up windows in advance of a bombing. It's sort of a, a dream of the past. And you see her laying these pieces of tape on a piece of glass before the camera, so she's very deliberately breaking the fourth wall. And I think there's other aspects as well, like these very carefully composed still life compositions, which reflect the direction that Parjanov was going. I think the reason why the um, studio executives in Armenia were so eager to bring Parjanov was that he had had a very big international success and they wanted something that would bring in income to the studio and also sort of improve their reputation within the Soviet Union because um, they had recently been criticized by the director of Goss Kino of Moscow for basically running a kind of shabby operation for a lack of organization, etc. And I, and I think they felt that bringing him on board with a very high profile project would improve their fortunes. <laughs> Saitnava was a poet of the 18th century, and he was also a singer. Actually, he was a bard. He was a medieval bard, uh, which were called Ashurs or Gusans in the earlier times. So this, uh, he was uh, writing his poems in three major languages of the, of the region. Uh, being Armenian, so he had Armenian songs and poems, and uh, he, he was writing in Georgian, but the, mostly in uh, um, uh, Ottoman Turkish, because it was the, uh, the language of the Gusan poetry. So it was a, a kind of a su Sufi professional poetry. Sen bizden ayrılıp başka bir dünyaya çekildin. Biz ise barama gozası yarattık ki Sen o dünyada kepenek kimi uçasın. Dulu ketirimi zuhir atar. İsk menk, desap roğneriz, badena vur etink kez bozuzuv, vur durş çakrez duku ayn nor aşkarum, vur bez titer. Şen gardak ve diyeme sopliden. Da çün, çoğurup tam siz kuş, sağ kaos dar çenilta, kan gimzadet. Arkia Breshumisa Rata Saikios Bebela Tahmo Printe. The choice of Site Nova was actually very significant. And the reason why is because only a few years earlier, they had celebrated the 250th anniversary of Syed Nova's birth in the Soviet Union. And this was actually a very big deal. Uh, it was in the newspapers. They, they did television documentaries about it. They published new translations of Syed Nova's work. And the reason why is because, because, par because Syed Nova wrote in three languages, Georgia, Georgian, Armenian, and Azerbaijani, he was viewed as a symbol of the brotherhood of the peoples of the Transcaucasus. I think there's a misconception uh, commonly that 
the Soviet Union was a prison house of nations and that the Soviet government had a very oppressive policy toward the different nationalities. And that's partly true, but it's not the whole picture. Um, they actually promoted the development of the individual nationalities because they saw this as a way of, move, of moving toward the path of socialism, ultimately. That once these different nationalities reached certain stages of development, that they would be able to merge into this broader um, international stream. Politically, I think it was important for the Soviet Union, which of course is based on a former empire, um, to give some space for the individual minorities for self-expression. And, and that's also one of the reasons why the um, central authorities in Moscow were a little bit reluctant to just cancel the project altogether because it was about such an important national topic. He has this childhood, he learns all these things, he falls in love with the king's sister, that doesn't work out, he goes to a monastery, he dies. Uh, that, I mean, that's roughly the trajectory of the film and that's clear, but it's really all in the kinds of formal embellishments and the, the way that Parajanov shows this story through images that are very similar to each other and yet disconnected from each other in a way that most film images are not. The, the interesting thing about The Color of Pomegranates is that Parajanov really saw this as a film had two layers. On the one hand, it was the story of Syed Nova, this 18th century uh, Armenian Ashu. On the other hand, the film was also about Parajanov himself. It had a very strong autobiographical component, and he was open about this. Uh, while he was making the film um, in interviews for the press and in, in a documentary film that was shot at that time, he talked about how, how Syed Nova's childhood reminded him of his own childhood and how it expressed um, growing up in Tbilisi and being surrounded by all these sights and sounds and smells. So he identified very strongly with Syed Nova in that respect. And he saw himself, I think, as a, as a poet of the Transcaucasus, as someone who brought all of these three cultures together. Parajanev uh, is, uh, he is a person who resembles Syed Nova. Why? Because he, he shot three films uh, actually doing the same thing as Syed Nova did in the 18th century. Uh, so in, in, uh, he had a field in Armenia, in Georgia, and Azerbaijan. He, he really became a new Sayat Nova for the three republics because all of them want him to be, to be there. <laughs> I think that another aspect of, of um, Parajanov's own personality, which um, played a large role in the color of pomegranates, is his fascination with art objects, um, handicrafts, um, folk music, etc. He saw, in, in his vision, the poet Sayat Nova drew his inspiration from the creative works of the people. All the things that they created with their hands, with their poetry, with their music, um, and so on. And, and I think Parjanov saw a strong parallel between himself and the poet Syed Nova. In the childhood, I said, I can't wait to stay in the head, I can't wait to stay in the head, I can't wait to stay in the head, I can't wait to stay in the head. Parajanov belongs specifically to what was known as the poetic or the archaic school in Soviet cinema. And this was a school that uh, arose in the 1960s and the 1970s. And uh, 
most of the filmmakers who were part of this school were non-Russian. Uh, Tartakovsky, for instance, would be an example of someone who was associated with it but was Russian, but he would be an exception. I think poetical cinema is not rhymes and rhythm and everything we know from the classical poetry. This is the attitude to the word that has many meanings. If you have on the screen images that you can give by yourself different interpretations in the same time, you know, the explanation is in Mandelstam's sentence. The word in poetry has many meanings in the same time, and the meanings come to the different directions. This is a poetical cinema. The cinema who gives you metaphorical image and explanation of the reality. He was interested in the poetic language of Sayat Noah, and he tried to translate the language of uh, the, the medieval, late medieval poets into the modern cinema language. If you look beyond the dynamic camera work of Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, you can see some similarities between sh the Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors and the color of pomegranates. Uh, Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors already starts to use tableaus very extensively. And he also um, uses visual metaphors like the, um, the motif of the red berries, um, which is repeated across the film. So he's already really starting to think in terms of this uh, poetic cinema, but he just pushes it in, in a much farther in The Color of Pomegranates. With The Color of Pomegranates, in a sense, one might say, as Yuri Lotman has said, uh, that Parajanov is working as an illustrator. He's using these images not in the way that motion pictures use images to tell a story with the moving pictures in a story world where the frame is functioning as a window opening onto this naturalized world where people are acting out the story. But rather, he's using, he's telling a story with unmoving images, much the way that book illustrations might tell a story. Victor Shklovsky, uh, a famous critic, wrote an essay called Poetry and Prose in Cinema, which was published in 1927. And he argues in that essay that there's really only two film genres, the prosaic and the poetic. And basically, uh, the prosaic is the cinema of a plot. Uh, and it might have a rhythm, but it's not a marked rhythm. Whereas in poetic cinema, you get these deliberate marked rhythms, for instance, of montage. Herbert Eagle says, for instance, that in poetic cinema, as opposed to narrative cinema, uh, it's not that each shot differs from the next in the sense of providing new narrative information. Rather, he writes, each shot is kind of similar to the shot that preceded it, because there might be a graphic rhyme. There might be a, a kind of patterning of a motif. There was a uh, uh, late motif of Ashkarisme uh, Panjarae, which means the world is a window. Panjara is a uh, word which is not now used in Armenian. Uh, it's of, of Persian or, origin, Iranian origin, and but in the times of Prava uh, Nova, uh, those uh, the windows were called Panjara. In any case, a typical panjara is figuring in the field. We see a, a window, a window which is like a cage, and there, there we have some birds sitting on it. And then I understood that he, even without knowing this, used panjara in poetic word, uh, words that's uh, me, uh, meaning that Sayat Novam uh, used in some of his verses, where uh, Panjara is also a, a cage. Panjara 
We have directors like Yuri Ilyenko from Ukraine, uh, Tengiz Abuladze from Georgia, uh, Balatbek Shamshev uh, from Arme uh, sorry, Kyrgyzstan, and uh, Artavaz Peleshyan from Armenia. What they did was they accentuated the cultural specificities of the republics in which they worked. So they'd accentuate things like folklore, costumes, decorative arts, music, verse. You know, some people think that uh, he, he was just an ethnographer, you know, so investigating ethnography of the place uh, of, of the people where he's shooting the film. Uh, he used also uh, his ethnographic language to make his poetic films. But not just he was following the rites, or so. he was sometimes he was creating rites. Uh, the most famous example is during his Ukrainian film, The, Suffer, the Forgotten Ancestors, where he invented a um, uh, uh, wedding ritual, which is now followed by the Gutsuls, uh, because they think that this is really the ancient ritual, but it was his invention. Конечно, возникали кое-какие разногласия между Раджанами и мною. Это на почве только чисто творческие разногласия были. Он иногда делал вещи, которые нельзя было допустить. Например, нашим монахам, которые снимались в картине в черных рясах, он завязывал белые пояса. Говорит, что ты делаешь? Говорит, Сергей, это недопустимо. В армянской церкви монахи не завязывают никаких поясов, белых никаких поясов. Это католический элемент. Католики завязывают пояса. Он говорит, зато это красиво. Но, говорит, за это красиво придется тебе отвечать перед церковью, перед народом. Народ не примет это все. И то же самое церковь. Вот. Он, в общем, убеждался, убеждался, конечно, и снимал эти поясы. Вот такие вот элементы, маленькие, на таких почвах были у нас чисто творческие споры. He was not a clerical, Parajana was not believer. He was not a believer. He liked all these rituals, habits, connected with Christianity, because he liked everything which was erzed and uh, of course it was spiritual, but it was erzed with this uh, appearance, because this crossings and uh, and in any of his film everybody is so worshiping or always uh, worshiping and so on so but in Parajana be in sight I never noticed it there really was sign of uh, his uh, believings to some gods or so. he was not believed what на студии я так немножко подождал то вышел Парадянов из от директора и потащил меня в сторону и сказал, чем ты занят, брось все, мы должны с тобой работать. Говорю, как, над чем там ты? Вот, говорит, меня уже утвердили сценарий Саят Нова, и мы должны вместе поработать, ты должен мне помочь, я тут никого не знаю в армии фильме, ты должен мне помочь со составить группу, и так далее, и так далее. Вот. Что и было сделано, потом через несколько дней мы поехали по районам Армении на выбор натуры для, для мест, где будет сниматься фильм. Мы были в Санаине, это исторические так сказать, места, где э, находятся наши соборы, церкви. И в Ахпате, недалеко от Санаина, вот, в Ахтале. И так далее. Uh, 
Надо учесть, что в фильмах, во-первых, он каждый кадр фильма рисовал сначала, маленькие кадры фильма. Вот «Тени забытых предков», весь фильм он заранее нарисовал. То есть фильм был у него в голове абсолютно. Он очень быстро работал, если бы ему не мешали там технические вещи, пленки нет, объектива нет, камеры нет, он бы очень быстро снимал, погоды нет и так далее. И потом уже, когда он приступал к съемкам фильма, он должен был своих героев представить, одеть их, как они одеты. Если вы наверху увидите на эскизы Ксатнова, они очень точные по пластике. Для него очень важна была фактура, пластика, жест. Сейчас ты смотришь фильмы современные, ты видишь, что режиссер не понимает ничего в этом. И, но для него, он мне сам говорил, что мне очень важно, вот когда этот человек с короткими руками и ногами говорит, умри, пой в конце, это говорит, очень важно было для меня, чтобы был именно такой человек, коренастый, плотный. Это все очень важно. Мы иногда не отдаем себе отчета, вот как сделан фильм. Он же смотрится как сон, этот фильм. У него нет ни начала, ни конца, в принципе. Ну, Бареми выбор натуры, он, э, увидя наши соборы, интерьеры в соборах, э, внутренняя часть, он все удивлялся и ругал себя что какой я, в общем, идет, что до сих пор не общался с корнями, с произведениями архитектуры моего народа. Он, когда приехал в Армению, ничего не знал об Армении, абсолютно. И вот мы во время этих поездок его ознакомливали с Арменией, показывали Армению с Арменией. И вот он все дальше, чем дальше, тем все больше восторгался Арменией, его архитектурой и так далее. И все больше влюблялся в, эти, в эту архитектуру. Он использовал и профессиональных актеров, но э, очень активно использовал актеров, которые неизвестны в кино. Главный герой его фильма, украинского фильма «Тени забытых предков» – это вот Миколай Чук. Он актер, но это был его первый дебют. Он впервые играл, и вот блестящий был дебют, который стал потом, после этого Миколай Чук стал любимым артистом украинского кино. Но это была его первая работа, то есть он был дилетант. Но с Параджаном, Параджан увидел в нем. Понимаете, он избегал театральных актеров. Понимаете? И поэтому он не смог там вот из армянского театра выбрать нужных актеров для этой роли. Все вторые роли исполняли в основном художники, музыканты, писатели, тоже непрофессиональные актеры. И была очень большая проблема, кто же будет играть Сайт Нову. Он мне показывал разные скульптуры, разные миниатюры. Говорит, вот такая пластика нужна, вот это нужно. И вот в один прекрасный день он вдруг мне приносит такой клочок, вырезанный из афиши лицо. Значит, это было лицо Софико Чаурели. Афиша была, она тогда исполняла Жаворна, Кануя. Она играла Жанну Дарк. И вот он говорит, вот это сайт нова. Sergei Parajanov m'a vu pour la première fois dans le film de Shota Managadze, La balade de Kevzoreti, en 1966. Et il a décidé qu'avec moi, il avait trouvé son Sayat Nova. Cela posait cependant un problème majeur. Parce que le film était produit en Arménie par le studio Armen Film et les producteurs ne voulaient absolument pas que ce soit une actrice géorgienne 
et de plus une femme, qui tiennent le rôle du grand poète Sayat Nova, un homme. Il y avait déjà un parfum de scandale derrière tout cela. Mais Paradjanov ne voulait pas revenir sur son choix. Il avait décidé qu'il tournerait avec moi seul, ou alors il ne ferait pas le film. Je pourrais évoquer très longtemps notre amitié, mais je veux seulement dire que dès ce film, il m'a dit « Tu es ma muse et je ne tournerai jamais de film sans toi. » Parjanov um, was also able to get a lot of the resources that he wanted to make for the film because it had so much ideological valence within the Soviet Union. Uh, for instance, Parjanov got permission from the Catholicos of the Armenian Church at Ejmiatsin to bring priceless relics from the from the church's collection up into the mountains for this uh, film shoot, which was, of course, something would be practically unheard of. And I think it was really the choice of Sayatnova that enabled him to get away with this. He used uh, n uh, no fake things. So, so all the things were authentic. When they were giving me uh, the costume, some, some parts of the costume, through uh, well, this ritual costume of bishops, so of Catholicos, so one shot I was playing Catholicos. Well, they were counting all, all the jewels there, you know, then, then giving, then counting back when, when I was giving it back. So it was real museum thing. So, so nobody, everybody was seeing that it's a real, a real ethnographic, and the historical things without, without realizing that, that he could do with this very strange and surrealistic things, but which in any case create this strange and new poetry, which was part. He used some uh, village boys who, was, who had to sing like surrealistic an angels because their, uh, their wings were made of, of horns, of some strange deer horns. And, uh, but he was making them, giving them spirit by singing Ave Maria. I have to say that Suresh Akhbajan and Parajan were big friends. They were both from Tbilisi, 
родились в Тибилищи. Вот. Потом начали работать на Киев студии Давженко, на студии Киевской, и, и подружились очень до того, как снимать фильм. Когда начали снимать фильм, у них были очень интересные отношения. Сурович Ахбазян был очень такой человек внутренний, молчаливый и, и не очень, так сказать, высказывал свое отношение, свое мнение к чему-либо. Он все равно молчал. И Сергей Параджанов придумал такую фразу. Но должен сказать, что Сурен Шахбазян блестяще снял картину, блестяще. Он по-новому, он понял, что хочет Параджанов, и делал все абсолютно, чтобы это было э, по вкусу Параджанова, потому что Параджанов, как он видит, как он представляет, так, чтобы было на экране. Вот. И так и получилось. Он снял очень блестящий фильм, очень хорошо снял. И эти фильмы, они э, почти уже смотрелись как живопись на экране. Как живопись. О, Сурен, Параджанов сказал мне, когда мы работали на этом «Колор помегранец», I set camera on tripod and I set a shot and then I went and I left, left the scene. When I came back, I noticed that the camera is slightly changed its position and I told Soren, return camera to the previous position. So it was like that. He adored this man, his cameraman, his son was named after this man, Soren Shafazan. And he was quarreling with him just because he, he wanted to be also the cameraman. <laughs> he wanted this uh, cameraman to, to make the uh, good quality, but he was doing, putting the, the shot. And I really started to understand that why he created the shadows of pomegranates and steels of, in a way of miniature. It was miniature. It's an Iranian one, a Georgian, maybe Armenian miniature. You can see a lot of them in manuscript. It looked like uh, this medieval painting, you know, which uh, it's a flattened painting. There is no third dimensions. There is no third dimension. So it was uh, two dimensional things. The camera is not moving because moving of camera always creates a third dimensional uh, and the lights are very even. There is no special effects uh, of cinematography. Uh, so uh, he created this film as a challenge to this Mr. Ilyenko to say, uh, not your moment of camera make me genius, I'm genius by myself and not because of your moving to and fro and your zooming and your <laughs> and so on and so on, uh, changing lenses. One only one lens was used, very normal one, only one point, and even uh, a raccourse as always was on the, the same level, the same angle, the same light. <laughs> Перед тем, как начать фильм, когда шли подготовительный период, что <coughs> Параджанову показывали армянские миниатюры, миниатюры, древние рукописи и древние э, картины, сделанные древними художниками, э, прекрасными Торос Рослин и так далее. Вот. Он когда увидел эти э, миниатюры, у него возник идея делать фильм в плане миниатюр, в плане пантомимии. То есть миниатюры не разговаривают, но понятны очень. Также он сделал фильм в виде миниатюрных эпизодов картин. 
Деньги разговаривают. Шла пантомима. Вот потому и фильм в Москве не приняли. О чем фильм? Что там говорят? Что там происходит? Народ не поймет то другое, потому что не было диалога. They gave him basically a free hand, at least initially. The, the first studio director who was in charge while Parajanov was working on The Color of Pomegranates was Lyot Vagyoshan, and he literally let Parajanov do anything he wanted. Like when Parajanov says, I need to bring in a, a llama for the film, he says, okay, go ahead, let him bring in a llama from the zoo, that's fine. There was a scene where he ordered some 100 horses and they could find only 10 for them. I'm happy that he didn't. And uh, that is Barajan. For with these 10 horses, he did more than other, other film directors could do with with hundreds and thousand horses that the others did. Теперь, что касается еще музыки, конечно, там есть песни соотнова некоторые, там есть музыка, которую Тиграм Мансурян сделал, но эту музыку ему фактически сказал, как делать Параджанов, просто технически он как композитор это все сделал. Но там есть песни и Комитаса, то есть намного поздние песни. И есть другие армянские песни, которые не связаны с Саатновой, но это не важно, потому что он хотел Армению показать. Il adorait les musiques nationales, les instruments nationaux comme le doudouk arménien, bien sûr. Il disait toujours que ses musiques le brûlaient intérieurement et l'aidaient dans ses émotions pour créer des images. Yes, gidays kız bir sebebi var. Mian mek yer bir dönçi ambosu çamp. İsk internasyonel yeren. Yev barrer aranzin. Ambos filmi meç betken ergaimlinen. Yev hemen pokrik mi darts vatsk. Mik hani gordzikneri gunayin միացությունների ձևով, որինակի համար կարող էր լինել միացված իրար դաշնամուրի լարերը և որ մատերով ես նվագում, ոչ թե կլավիշով, այլ լարերը զանք և թար։ միացներուց բոլորովի մի ուրիշ հետաքիր միտք է ստացվում։ Ուրեմ են այս ինտոնացյաները Սայատնովայից է ես վեսնում։ Եկրորդը կային բարր էր առանձին, որ իր երկից է ու եվ որ նույն բարը գրկնում ես, բոլորովին իր ծավը, իր ներքի զգացումը, իր պահանջը անային։ Կանց մեջ արեն շատացի, շատացի, շատացի, շատացի, 
շատացել է, շատացել է, շատացել է, եվ ոմ մին բան ասում ես, դա նոր իմ աստեստանում բարը ինքը, մեկ բարը։ Դարում են դիզարելի։ Եվ միայն մեկ մի տեսարանում կա միայն, որտեղ երկը հնչում է, բայց են է ոչ ամբողջությամբ սկզբիս մինչև վերջ, էլի տրանսվորմացվել է, էլի մտել է ամբողջի մեջ, բայց բավագան ծավալուն երկե դա վերջի մոտ է ավելի, թակուվում ու թաղման տեսարանում է այդ երկը։ Հաղերում է լիզարը ասեցի, որ այդպես մտել է ամբորջ հուսվածքի մեջ, բայց խնդիրի միայն այդ չի, որ մտել է հուսվածքի մեջ ինդվորացանները Սայատնովա երկերից, դրանք մտել է նաև ժողորդական երկերի հուսվածքի մեջ, ընդեղկան ինդ Հառասարակ փոքրիկ հատվածը վերցնելը, ամբողջից կոնտեկստից հանելը և մի ուրիշ փոքրիկ հատվածի դնելը շատ է դա կիր արդյունք է տալիս իմ պատկերացմամբ, դա շատ հիշեցնում է իկեբանայի արվեստը, ծաղիկը պունչ � ճիշտ այդպես ինտրանցանդերը կտրում ես և ուրիշ հարավերության մեջ ես դնում և ստացում եմ ասովոր ուժի մի կեղացկություն, կան եթե դրանք բնական սկսեին և բնական վերջանային։ Մինչև այս շիրմի մեջ մտնել կարթացել էի նաև նութեր, որտեղ նկարագրվում են նրանց աշխատանքի պրոցեսը, ինչպես են նութերը հավակում և ինչ միջոցներով են ստանում իրենց պետ կեղաց արդյունքը։ Բայց պետք ասեմ, որ ես ոչ թե դեպի շեվեր և դեպի պեր անդրի էի գնում, այդ ես գնում է դեպի վիրմի պահանջացը։ Եվ նրանց առած աշխատանքը ինձ համար լավորինակ էր։ Իր էստետիկայի հիմքում պարաջանովի ամենա պարզ կենցաղային իրերն են, որ գետնից բարշրացված և դրված են շրջանակի մեջ։ Ամբողջ է սա է։ Ձուկ կլնի դա, դա կլնի ճաշի աման, դա կլինի կոշի, կլինի մարմնի մի մաս լողացող կնոչ։ Եվ այլն, ծրանք բոլորը առանձին Այս արժեքը նա խեն տանալու է, կարող էր նաև մի վարակույրի, կարող էր նաև մի պատոհանի, մի դրան զանգի, կամ են կոճակի, որով պետք է խպես, ենպեսի կյանք էր դրա մեջ տեսնում, որ այսօր ես այդ փորձը իրենից � են թա խորքերը մտնել այդ իրի, կանի մարդ է ձերտվել, ովքեր են, ինչ կյանք հանցել ես իրի վրայով, ինչ հետքեր ունի սա իր վրա, այս ամբողջը իր վիլմի ներսից են։ Ես տեսավորի, պետք է նույն կենցաղի ձայներ
Значит, Параджанов, он вообще у него был постоянный монтажер. Монтаж он проводил всегда в Киеве. Монтажер была Пономаренко, с которой он работал все фильмы. Поэтому он материал взял из Еревана, повез в Киев, там смонтировал и привез показывать Ереван. Already at the script stage, from the very start, the film provoked a divided response. Uh both within Armenia and in Moscow. Uh, some of the people really liked the film's poetic approach and Parajanov's innovative visual style, while others complained that it was too difficult to understand, and I think there's, I think there's some justification for that, and also that it took too many liberties with the historical figure of Sayanova. То, что хотел сделать Parajanov, его авторская подлинная фирма существовала две недели, пока он вот привез Ереван, пока он показал, потом из Еревана повезли в Москву, и где это все было потом уже отрезано. Понимаете, тогда, значит, фильм э, выпустили только для армянского проката, было всего пять копий напечатано, и, э, значит, были написаны титры, перед каждой новеллой были такие титры, написанные на армянском языке. Должен сказать, что к титры писателя он обратился к такому замечательному армянскому писателю Гранту Матевусяну, но он по характеру был далек от средневековья. Он был мастер такой крестьянской, деревенской прозой. Ну, то, что у нас так называется деревенщик, вот такое у нас есть такое выражение. Вот. И поэтому вот этот стиль средневекового, это все, это был ему далек. И я не могу назвать, что эти титры, которые написал хороший писатель Грант Матевусян, но написал он не очень удачные титры. Они еще больше осложняли смысл, еще более все He wrote a poetic, his, his own poetic thing, which uh, Parajanov didn't know. He, he couldn't read Armenian, by the way. He, he knew this colloquial Armenian, but not in the written Armenian. So it was not his creation, it was not his style. I, I definitely wouldn't call the Armenian release version a director's cut. One thing you have to keep in mind is that virtually no Soviet director had final cut over the film within the Soviet studio system, much as Hollywood directors in the um, studio system in, in the classic Hollywood era um, had final cut over a film. The fact that the many episodes that were connected to Anna and her love with Anna and Sayatnovi были сняты очень красиво, очень хорошо, но не вошли в фильм. Это потребовало Госкино, потребовали в верхах урезать, снять там такое еще. Был такой эпизод, в Ахпате сняли арочный проем, где я поставил стекло, большое стекло. С одной стороны оттуда, значит, Анна подходит к этому стеклу, отсюда Заятнова подходит к этому стеклу. И они свою любовь выражают тем, что они начинают вот по этому стеклу вот такие вот движения делать там такое. И в этот момент опрыскивается белая жидкость в это стекло. И они размазывают, начинают размазывать все это дело. Но это понятно, что это под текст какой там так и все. Вот. И потом они оба прильнули к этому щеками, к этому стеклу. И так кончается. Очень хороший, красивый кусок сняли это дело. Вот. И вот таких масса кусков, которые сняли. Осталось там кусок, который Анна моется в бане, и на ее грудь ставится эта раковина. Это раковина, кстати говоря, это моя раковина, тут наверху я подарил музею. Эта раковина ставится на ее грудь, потом снимается, там такой же. Вот это и осталось. Symbolically, you have uh, the white color as a color of a pride. So it's not just pollution. Uh, not that semen is white, which is also a very, very special thing. And you have, you can find many uh, analogs in symbolic world, in anthropology and other things. But here he had this visualizing, and he's becoming white in his in his dream, and he does not have Anna, but 
who is who who is whom he has this is lama arochun yere khais ye gyal yere khayutene magardochun magardi hanon or ye vortvo ye vok minserko there was a small the uh, chapel or something i don't remember uh, the standing and it was half ruined he put me as a monk on the top of it which was a, uh, by the way a dangerous thing because it was very shaky and he said just as if uh, i am peeping it was as if a monk a, a, a gay monk, perhaps he thought that to say homosexual monk was was peeping how uh, how he was baptized, how he was he was washing. But then he said that I thought that this was too obvious, and he cut himself this uh, these things. Uh, the film uh, where Parajana was finished about sixty-eight. For the, the first version in uh, Yerevan, of course, everybody knew the difficulties of um, Parajanov's life and creative work in uh, Ukraine, and everybody was waiting for this film. Uh, and we saw also, I remember very well, the pictures, stills from the film we saw in a magazine. Everybody was waiting for this new step of poetical cinema. But then the film was forbidden because, not only because of the formalism, but also about uh, Parajanov's anarchism, so-called, yeah. He was very critical, as you know, and he was also, he was joking about the rulers of our cinema. And they were not only badly educated, they didn't understand anything about the film, and the film was without a plot. After the film is finished and it's just getting ready to be released within Armenia, um, the, the chair of Goss Kino of Armenia had just convinced Romanov to release the film because otherwise it might have been banned altogether. And Romanov says about the film, the material doesn't yield any possibility of gaining any new understanding of Syat Nova whatsoever about the real life journey of the great poet of the Transcaucasus and about his place in the development of Armenian national culture. The material viewed by the committee is lacking any clear and consistent thought. It falls apart into separate scenes and episodes, not logically connected to one another. It is overburdened with symbols and allegories that are false, unreadable. The material is characterized by the author's striving for purely formal decorative effects that are deprived of meaning. And Parajanov, after receiving this, this memo, fired back with a letter uh, claiming that Romanov was insulting the great Armenian people. I think the main reason why the film wasn't banned was that they, they, the people in Moscow felt that they had to leave the decision to Goskino of Armenia because it was about this Armenian culture figure. They didn't want to be perceived as stepping on Armenia's toes. So what happened as a result is Romanov limited the distribution of the film to Armenia. He let them show it there, but, but nowhere else. Different famous uh, people tried to help Parajanov. Yudkevich was one of them. Yudkevich promised to help Parajanov with some titles to explain the um, plot, the biography of Sayat Nova, and he did it. The reason why Sergei Yukevich re-edited the film is he was asked by the Armenians to do this. And this was because he had actually served as a reader on the script in Moscow in the initial stages. And he liked the film and supported Parajanov's work. So they, they thought that 
if he could make a few changes to the film, they might be able to get Moscow to agree to release it in the rest of the Soviet Union. I am not sure that he asked Parajanov. This is, was maybe his mistake. Maybe, I don't know the details. There were a joke at that time, rumors uh, in our milieu of cinemas, that both of them were Sergei Yosifovich, Patronimix Yosifovich, and the name Yudkevich and Parajanov, Sergei Yosifovich. And Parajanov was calling to Yudkevich when he saw his version a little bit cut it, and with titles between episodes. Parajana was calling Yudkevich and everybody quoted his sentence, Sergei Iosifovich, I cannot recognize Sergei Iosifovich on the screen. One of the scenes that's gone, for instance, is the episode where you see the man standing on the roof of the monastery mowing grass with sides. And there's a few other shots here and there that are cut, um, but it's really not that much footage. Yudkevich was very sad. As I remember, he was very sad because he wanted the best to, to help Parajanov. Parajanov did want to sign, but this was the only one way to get the film on the screen. And this compromise of Yudkevich was actually helpful, but of course it was a little bit uh, different from idea of Parajanov. Many authors and crit criticists are saying that, oh, well, censors cut, then it's a very bad thing. It's not a bad, bad thing. <laughs> Yudkevich saved the film, and Parajanov knew this. Uh, just uh, uh, when they began to do this, and he was a friend of Parajanov, so he really was saving the film. The name was changed by this Armenian functionary. At, at the, the, he said, well, I like this name. It was just when it, uh, they, they uh, said that Sayatnava is not good, let's save, and he said, color bomb, he said, it's, it's okay. I, do you think it's okay? <laughs> and it was just the time when it came. And uh, more than that, I can tell you that uh, censors cut, in a sense, is closer to Parajanov than the original cut. I mean, uh, the, the short, uh, the short um, stories with titles. He followed it in his Surami Fortress. So, so, so I see. Then he followed it in, in his Ashikari. And then I see that it was very close to his thinking. I think Parajanov learned a little bit from Yudkevich's contribution. You know, because after this conflict situation when he was very nervous, and I can understand his reaction, but in the same time, he understood what Yudkevich did, simplifying a little bit his structure. But at the same time, it made really more accessible for the audience. So, what is the difference between the author's variant and the other variant? There is a big difference. But it is interesting that Фильм, когда показали, мы показали в Ахпате, в Алавердах, народу, который снимался у нас в фильмах. Вот народ фильм понял и принял, но средний сословие общества, средний, не понял и не принял. И приняли фильм только элита, верхние художники, там, актеры, только поняли, а средний не понимал. И понимал народ. Вот это вот удивительно. I saw the film five times at that time. You know, I saw, first of all, in a magazine, Искусство кино, and I was very impressed. And then I saw it in a film theater, and then in a Dom Kino, and, and with different audiences. Of course, the naive audience, the large audience, was not very impressed. They didn't understand, actually, the film. It was not also released so widely, you know, but... But when the film was on the screen in a small film theater, it was full. And I know that the film clubs discussed the film many times in all over the country. This film became a cult film. 
Uh, Victor Shklovsky really admired the film, and of course, as we know, he later agreed to collaborate with Parajanov on a couple of screenplays. Um, Yuri Lotman, the semiotician, um, also saw the film and even made a reference to it in his um, book on film semiotics. Probably the most famous review of the film came in an, essay, in an epi issue of Iskuspo Kino uh, by the author Michal Blaman, who um, wrote an essay called Archaists or Innovators about the Poetic School. And this ended up really being a, a, a not so thinly veiled critique of the Poetic School as a whole and the color of pomegranates in particular. And I think that review is very significant. And the reason why is because Blaman, like Yukevich, had been a script reader on the film, but his comments were much more negative than Yukevich's. And in fact, for later projects such as um, Intermezzo, which was another film that Parjanov wanted to make in the early 1970s, but wasn't able to, Blayman once again served as a reader behind the scenes, and he actually wrote a memo recommending that Parjanov be removed from the film industry altogether. A lot of people in the West actually assumed that Parajanov was arrested because of the color of pomegranates and they described it as a dissident film um, and, and so on. And also because they hadn't seen the Armenian version, they didn't really know what was actually cut for the film. The imprisonment of Parajanov is a complex story. I, I think there are multiple reasons behind it. Of course, on the surface, there were the charges for which he was ultimately convicted, which included um, consensual sodomy, um, rape and the dissemination of pornography, so basically sexual crimes. The real reason why he was arrested, I think, has to do with his association with these Ukrainian nationalists. Because of what of Shadows of Forgotten Ancestors, um, the film really sparked this poetic school in Ukraine, and he became the, the figurehead, in a sense, of these young Ukrainian filmmakers and intellectuals. So they were, in, in a sense, cutting off the symbolic head of this movement. Why do you think Parajanov was a Soviet film director? Because they now it's, uh, it's in, in the habits to, uh, to say everything bad about Soviets, like it was a kind of Stalinism, only connected with Stalin's, only connected with 37 years, connected with pogroms, connected with uh, mass killings, but uh, the Soviet Union was not so black and white, you know. It was always multicolored, and uh, uh, the, I think the fantastic cinematography was created in, under this Soviet censorship. I, I consider The Color Pomegranates to be Parajanov's masterpiece. The film is really valuable as a cultural document which depicts the very rich artistic heritage of the cultures of the Transcaucasus. Every person who comes to this film is going to experience it differently. Uh, people might come to it from Parajanov's milieu, uh, knowing Syed Nova, knowing his poetry, knowing those objects. And those objects in, in that experience is going to be very different. It's going to have a different resonance than for, say, uh, an American student watching the film for a first time, where everything is a little bit stranger, but perhaps equally dazzling. It's the opposite to this high technology films, which gives you a lot of possibilities, technical possibilities. The film, this film is very simple. And this kind of collage cinema gives you understanding how you can make really innovative film from very simple materials. For me, this film is one of the best to teach young generation to make films very personal and at the same time very modern.